welcome to Black Belt Selling with Stephanie and Anna Scheller. I'm Anna. And I'm Stephanie. We are a mother-daughter team who are passionate about helping you grow your business by closing more sales. You can learn more about us by joining our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Black Belt Selling. We invite our guests like the phenomenal guests that we have today and also for you to post motivational comments things to help other people along their journey to become better at sales so that's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash black belt selling and you get notifications when our shows go live on soundcloud so please join us there ask we've uh we've not turned anybody away that i know of have we stephanie well, you know, if you look particularly scammerish, we might we might question you and interrogate you before we let you join the group. But for the most part, we're pretty easygoing. We are pretty easy. So, um, and we'll let you know about that again at the end of the show. But I want to get to our guest. Our guest today is Anthony, and I'm gonna say Yanarino. That's right. Is that how pretty I pronounce close. your name? Pretty close. Anarino. Anarino. Okay. Anarino. All right, I'm going to fix that right there. So Anthony is a highly respected international speaker, best-selling author, entrepreneur, and sales leader specializing in the complex business-to-business -business sale. He's also the founder and managing partner of two closely held family-owned businesses in the staffing industry, leading both entities in strategic planning while growing sales. Anthony's best known for his work at The Sales Blog, and you can find him there at thesalesblog.com, which has helped him to gain recognition as a top thought leader in sales strategy. And we have the privilege of having him join us today. So Anthony, welcome to Black Belt Selling. Thanks for having me. Well, I have to say, Anthony, before we get going too much further, We've had so much buildup to you coming on this show. So you, you have <laughs> to fill, but you know, it started off well when I saw that you shave your head because my husband does too. So you automatically got bonus points. Awesome. That's good. <laughs> well, um, you are, you know, I, I really relate to you, Anthony, because uh, actually I got started in sales because of a family owned business. But um, how did owning a business lead you to do sales? Because it doesn't always happen that way. It, w it was, I mean, certainly it wasn't something that I decided. And you know, in a family business, you get uh, a lot of special advantages over other people. You get to come in earlier. You get yes. to stay later. <laughs> you get to clean the bathrooms and do anything else that no one else wants to do um, and, and finds a way to get around. And when my mom who started the business with her business partner decided to start a light industrial staffing division. I was 19 and they put me in that job at minimum wage where my job was going to be to interview people and place them on assignments. And I had no idea what that even meant when they gave me the job. But what they told me to do was in between things, if I had time, call people and see if anybody needs anything, see if anyone would use temporary help. And this is a long time ago. So it wasn't, it wasn't like it is now where it's a widely accepted uh, marketplace, mm -hmm. but it, 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 it was growing at that time and they had the foresight to notice that. So I, I ended up with a little uh, binder. I mean, a very, very small binder. Imagine a, a binder that only holds three by five note cards. And oh, on wow. these note cards, was every objection that someone might say to me when I asked for an appointment to come out and talk to them. And I was told to pick up the phone and call people. That was the most direction that I got. And then whatever they say, flip it, to, flip it open in the binder and go to the answer and overcome their objection and schedule the appointment. And that's what I did. And the very first call I made, the gentleman on the other end of the phone immediately hung up on me. But before he did, he said, call me back when you don't need a script. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I, that's how scripted I sounded. And, <laughs> and I think it's great to have a script, but it's not great to sound like you're reading a script. And I called my mom and her business partner. They're very small business at that time. I mean, probably a couple million dollars. And I called and said, I called this guy and he told me to call back when I don't need a script. Uh, what do I do? There's not anything in the binder. 
that speaks to this. And they said, you call him right back and you ask him again for the appointment. And I, I didn't know any better. So I picked up the phone, I called right back and I said, listen, this is my first day on the job and I'm using this script, but I, I want to come out and see if I can help you. And he goes, okay, come out. That was it. And I thought, okay, well that, that worked. So I, I, I just made calls and I didn't know what I was doing or why I was doing it or how I was supposed to succeed. And I was 19 and I was fronting a hair metal band at night. And uh, some people said yes. And when they said yes, I'd come and see them. And uh, some of them would give me orders. And I did not think I was selling. I wasn't hired to sell. I was not told I was a salesperson. It's just a job that needed done. And that's what you're supposed to do in a family business. So if you would have said, hey, uh, so you're a salesperson, I would have said, no, I just work at a staffing company. I don't sell. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's funny. That's pretty much my exact same story. I, I arrived for my first day of work. They sat me down in front of the phone with a copy of the yellow pages and said, start calling. And I said, well, what do I say? <laughs> they said, just tell them you work at this and this place. You want to come out with me with them. I had no idea I was a salesperson. I didn't know any of this stuff. So yeah. I, I can completely relate. So I'm curious then, because you, you're successful. But you have a couple of businesses now, right? Two, two of them? Three, three. Three. Okay, three businesses, you overachiever, you. Um, so how have they shaped your view on sales and business? Like, obviously, it's continued, and now you do understand you're in sales. So how has this happened? I mean, I, I think that the, there's a certain set of experiences you get as someone who's responsible for a business, which means you're responsible for the entire success of a business. You're responsible for strategy. You're responsible for execution. You're responsible for client acquisition. You're required to do everything. And you, you get a very, very different understanding of how business works than a salesperson would have. And a salesperson who's never owned a business is sort of deprived of the opportunity. I actually haven't written this yet on the blog, but I have a note to write it. Every salesperson should be running some sort of a side hustle business where they have their own P&L because yeah. your business acumen and the way that you think about business is radically changed when you're responsible for the whole business. When you're mm -hmm. a salesperson, you say, why can't I just give them an 11% discount? And, and uh, as a business owner, you say, because if we did that across the board, instead of having a 4% net margin at the end of the year, we'll have a negative 7% net margin and we'll lose our funding. That's why. And uh, until yeah. you know these things, you don't sell well and you don't look at business through the eyes of a business person. And this is the challenge for salespeople right now. If you want to be a black belt um, riffing on your name, I mean, a black belt, you're a business person. You, you work in the role of sales, but you're a business person and you're a peer and you understand why your clients make the decisions that they make and strategically what are they trying to do and how should they be thinking about it. And if you don't have that, I continually tease audiences when I speak. You only need two things to be a trusted advisor, trust and advice. advice. <laughs> and if you don't have the advice, you can't be a trusted advisor. So if you don't know more than the person you're talking to uh, in some area, mm -hmm. they don't need you. I mean, they need somebody who knows some things that they don't know and who has a strong point of view and an opinion about how to move into the future. And it's easier to do if you if you run a business. It's just easier. You just have a very different level of business acumen. Yeah, that's a. I I find that fascinating too because whenever we bring guests on, usually Stephanie or I've had an experience in the area, and like we don't. Well, we we do have scripts, so um, hopefully it's not coming across quite so scripted. But it's invariably that something has happened and our guest is talking about it. So I was, uh, I was at a furniture store today and um, I have to buy some furniture for the housing company. And uh, I'll be honest, I went through and I found the stuff that's discounted that ne they needed to move so that I didn't have to pay so much. And um, because of that, I did not walk in to ask for a discount. Now in the past, they had, the store had given it to me um, for higher end prices, but and suddenly in the conversation, the guy said, you know, people ask me for discounts. And uh, I, I really, I have to, at the end of the day, make sure that my owners have a profit. And I thought that's such an unusual 
perspective for a salesperson because most salesperson are out for their commission because the bottom line is they get paid uh, whether the owner gets paid or not. And so that's, that's really, I think that's really important. And I think that if most salespeople are honest with themselves, they are in business for themselves. Mm -hmm. They really are in business for themselves. They're just not looking at P and L's like we do. But they, they have one. I mean, if, if you want to talk about a salesperson being in business for themselves, I mean, you, you, whatever your compensation is, that's your profit and loss statement. I mean, that, that's yeah. it. And when you, when you think about this, everyone is a commission only salesperson at some level. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you, you are at some level commission right. only and you have to create value for other people and command the rate that you're worth. But if you want to command a higher rate, you have to create greater value and you have to go convince someone that you're worth paying more for, for that. And uh, I think all of us, whatever you're doing, what, whatever you're getting paid, that's your commission for the value that you create, just like a salesperson. And it, it's a very healthy way to look at it to say, here, here's the, the interesting thing. I have so many people tell me that they're money motivated and mm. I continue to tell them that they're not money motivated and I can tell. And they say, how can you tell? And I say, because you don't have any money. Um, money motivated people <laughs> have are money. motivated. Yeah, they have money and it's because they're motivated by money. And so they do things that you don't do because they're motivated by money. What you, mm. what you do, you want more money. And if, if we went to all of the 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet and said, would it be helpful for you to have more money? Would you like that? Invariably, we would get a yes from every single one of them, probably including Buffett and Gates and Zuckerberg. They would all say, yeah, it'd be great to have another billion. Um, everyone wants more money, but it doesn't mean that you're money motivated. Money motivated means you're willing to take the actions that generate mm -hmm. that money, and most aren't. And salespeople would do better to think I'm in business for myself and I have to run a good business and I have to run the kind of business that can sustain not only my life, but if they have family, you know, all the other people that count on you. Right. Right. And I agree. Yeah. Did you just take a selfie? I totally did. <laughs> yeah, I was going to post it to Instagram. <laughs> but I, actually, I took a picture of the screen and then I just posed in the, where I've got the screen right there. <laughs> Okay, I got to see this picture. Oh, no, no. Well, you're taking up most of it, so. <laughs> Here. You know, while we're, while a, we're all distracted. This is a new. This is there a you new, go. There you go. <laughs> That's funny. There you go. There you go. I have the, I have the gallery view. <laughs> well, well, no, but I totally agree with this whole, like, this whole train of conversation. I've been talking about it and talking about it and trying to get all of these salespeople that I'm, I'm working with to understand you are your own business. You know, the definition of an entrepreneur is someone who takes on greater than normal risk for greater than normal reward in the business world. And that's exactly what these salespeople are doing. They're paid by commission. I mean, I know you're taking it further than that to even people who are on salary, but, but I try and tell every salesperson, the sooner you get it through your head, you are your own business. The sooner you will actually start to make more money. Yeah. Okay, off my soapbox. So, <laughs> did you have a question, Mom? Well, I actually think this ties in because you're, we're talking about motivation, and our motivation is affected by the way we view ourselves, and that directly affects business and, so, and sales. What do you find are the most common misconceptions that people have about themselves that affect their ability to sell? The biggest one right now, um, and, and in some ways it, it is a shortcoming for a lot of people, the, the misconception is that I don't have to be a peer. I, I don't have to be a peer to the person I'm sitting across from. I'm a oh. salesperson, and so I have to be subservient. I have to try to serve this client. I have to try to be agreeable. And, and they, they come at this with a view of uh, what I would call a vendor or a supplier, but not a trusted advisor. And, mm -hmm. and it's a lack of confidence in themselves, number one, and it's a fear that holds them back from being who they need to be to actually be that peer and to be that trusted advisor. 
and to be consultative and to challenge the client and say, look, there's another way for you to look at your business. There's another way to look at getting this outcome. I have different ideas and things that are working in other places that I need to show you. And they, they, they have a misunderstanding that they, they'll frame it this way for you. They'll say something like, I can't, challenge that customer with this insight because they know more about their business than I do. Hmm. And, and they do, they know more about their business, but right. they don't know more about your business and they don't know more about what all of their competitors are doing because they're not talking to their competitors uh, in, in the same way that a salesperson can. And a salesperson gets to look at a hundred companies that are doing something and you get to look at one. And so the, the understanding of the nuances and the trade-offs and the decisions that might be made is very different for a rep who has some sort of knowledge, what I call situational knowledge or a set of experiences that give you a strong point of view about things. That's worth money. I mean, that's worth paying mm -hmm. for. That's what, when, when you think about taking a, a person, a business person's time, they're paying for that with the, the most precious commodity on earth, the limited time they have to generate results in their business. So you better be up here and you better have something worth talking about. That's not your product, your service or your solution. It better be something that's interesting to them about how they drive their business forward. But I would say the greatest misconception is that I don't have to be up here. I don't have to be somebody who's an equal to the person I'm sitting across from uh, as it pertains to business knowledge. And it's an enormous mistake being made right now. Wow. You know, I mean, I've never looked at it from that perspective. And of course, we are, we teach people that, that it, we're there to serve. But that's really, that's a new perspective for me in terms of, I, I come to people as a peer, but also to serve them. But um, that's very interesting. How, how do you recommend Go ahead, um, Steph. I, was, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think no. you have to serve someone while still being that pure and, and understanding. I love your point because understanding that just because you may know more about your bit, like I was talking with an attorney right before this and he, he commented about, he was asking me questions about marketing and we were talking and, and he commented about how he's got the whole attorney thing figured out. It's this, it's this marketing thing he's dealing with. And I laughed and I said, well, that's good because I got the marketing thing figured out, but I don't have the attorney thing figured out. So as long as you've got that and I've got mine, we're good to go. And he laughed, but that's, that's exactly the level you got to come at it from. Hey, we're, we're on the same level. We may not have the same knowledge, but that's what makes us valuable to each other. It's not in conflict with serving. It's how you serve. Exactly. I mean, so yeah. let, me, let me frame it another way. If, if your prospective client or what I call your dream client could get the results that they were capable of getting without you, they'd already be getting those results. And if your competitor was capable or insightful enough or interested enough in helping them produce those results, they'd already be helping them do that, but they're mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. So that, that means it's up to you to decide what role you play, but you don't serve people by allowing them to keep the status quo. You serve people by helping them change. And, and that means I'm going to have to ask you to change. And it's a peer that can do that. Somebody who's subservient and afraid. I'm not saying that you're not serving. I'm saying you're not subservient where, where I have mm -hmm. to be afraid of you because you have power that I don't have. Um, that, that's not the position that you need to stake out right now. And it, th what I'm saying is not easy. And it's a big step for most salespeople. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big, big growth initiative to say, I need to be a peer, but that's what you need to be. Um, how, if somebody feels that might be listening, feels that, oh my gosh, that's like, that's me. How do you, how can you, or how could they overcome that? And we understand it's a process, but what's the best way for them to start to become a peer and not <coughs> subservient or fearful in sales conversation? It is, um, there's a couple things. It depends on who they are and where they are in their development. If, if you're a young person, I can tell you how I did it without knowing what I was doing. I just knew that I didn't know very many things. I, I knew I didn't know very many things. So and I'm a curious person. I'm interested in the world and I'm interested in ideas and I'm interested in other people. And I would go to clients and say, you keep using the word throughput. And I think I know what that means, but I don't understand what it means in the context of your business or how you're measuring it or what somebody like me should do to help you with that. 
And then they would start oh, wow. educating me and they would say, listen, this is how we think of it. And, and about four or five times of asking that question, I would show up at a distribution center and I'd say, what are your throughput numbers like? And is that something you're working on right now? And they go, oh, this guy knows throughput. He gets it. Oh. And the, 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 then they're like, oh, he, he actually understands our business. And then I, I, as I learned more and more and more and more people educated me, I had different insights where I could say, you know what? I know some people make this trade off and other people make this trade off. Here's what I've seen happen before. Here's what I've seen happen in other cases. And you start to accumulate the knowledge because you're out and you're trying to actively capture what I call situational knowledge. The experiences that let you say, okay, there's trade-offs to be made. How do you think about these trade-offs? That, that's one way to do it. If you're, if you're a person who has low confidence, then you, you need to find some language choices. You need a talk track to be able to say, uh, listen, Anna, I don't know your business as well as you do, but I have a, a hunch and we have an opinion about the things that you're talking about right now. Can I share it with you and get your feedback on this? And then I'm testing the waters. I'm getting a chance to have a conversation to feel somebody out so I can get some more confidence about where to take them. And if you're just fearful because you haven't done this before, I would say at some point, if you've got the experience and you've got the time, you just have to decide, I'm going to go ahead and play this way mm -hmm. and say, you know, I, I have an idea that's worth you looking at and it's very different and you're probably not going to like it when you see it. But if you take the time to look at it and you really explore it, we may end up doing something here that's going to transform the results you're getting now. And you, you just have to be willing to do that. And uh, for, for a, a lot of people, they are deep subject matter experts, very consultative. They just haven't yet taken that step forward and they can do that. Mm -hmm. So what, um, that step you're talking about, you talk about it like it, it's, it's easy, but I know this is kind of one of the big struggles for a lot of people is to take that step that, that, you know what, I'm just going to go do it. And I'm just going to, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to find what works and what doesn't work and just go but what advice do you have? I mean, one of the things we talked about on Black Belt Selling is kick through the walls, kick through what holds you back. What do you have? What kind of advice do you have for someone who's sitting here going, I want to do this, but I'm scared or, or, or whatever? You, you have to learn to be comfortable in conflict. And the interesting thing about um, martial arts is that the reason martial artists do well in conflict is because they put themselves in physical conflict over and over again every day while they're training. Yeah. And so once you're past that, I've actually recommended this to people who are conflict averse to go take a martial art and, and have somebody punch and kick them. Um, because after that, the, the fear of somebody being mad at you starts to lessen quite a bit because it's not physical conflict and there's none of that's going to happen. You, you do run the risk of making people unhappy when you tell them their baby's ugly. I mean, that's <laughs> it. And you do. And, uh, and there are some people who are defensive, but what I would tell you is start with people who are mature business people who are not going to be defensive about their baby being ugly and who are going to say, you're right. I yeah. put this bow on, but it doesn't seem to be doing much for the baby. What do you have in mind? And, uh, and, and, and that's the thing. You have to find the experiences that teach you how to have the conversation and you are going to have some conflict. And the fact of the matter is in business, there's conflict yeah. and in sales, what we hope for is a lot more collaboration, but there's also conflict and not just on our side, not a conflict between us and the client, but there's conflict between the different stakeholders inside a company. They don't agree on what the next right thing is. And, and so there's always this tension that's going on and you just have to be comfortable in it and say, look, it's not personal. It's just important. And I'm going to have the conversation because it's important. No matter what happens, I know it's not personal. I'm trying to help people. Mm -hmm. but but yeah I would say wade into it and find some friendly people who are going to let you play at a higher level and then as you get more experience work into the more grouchy you know uh, director dominant types who are going to argue with you sound advice that's yeah um, and you know speaking of black belt being a black belt you know one of the things we do is we look for ways to create more results with less um, with less tension, less energy. And, and so right. um, one of the things that you talk about is prospecting velocity. And so prospecting is not a popular topic um, when it comes to sales, but it is probably the most important sales activity 
we do because if you're not speaking to people, if you're not out there letting them know what you're doing, obviously there's not going to be much room for practicing your wonderful sales skills. Right. And so talk to us about prospecting velocity. What is that? How do we develop that? It's uh, it is, um, velocity is different than speed. So speed, it says that you're going fast. Velocity says you're, you're moving in a, in a certain direction and displacing. It's a displacement measurement. So I think the way that I would describe this to people, uh, you, you have to produce results. And the velocity of the result that you produce is going to be, at, at some level, two, two factors. How much energy am I putting into this? And how effective is that energy? And for most people, they're putting too much uh, emphasis on passive things that they believe are going to be opportunity creation, social yeah. media being one of them. And, yes. uh, and, and, and one that's been, I think, wildly exaggerated when it comes to the results that it produces, but it doesn't produce any velocity. There's no speed. And, and, and here's the thing that it's tough for salespeople to understand. I continue to, to try to explain this. If, if you work in a business and you need to create four $100,000 deals in January so that you have 200,000 that you can win with a 50% win rate, if you did not create those four in January, then you will not win those four in April. So now you go into February and you think, well, I can make it up and I'll try to get eight in February. If you get two in February, because you're already behind because you didn't do the prospecting work, now you still have six plus four going into March. You've got 10 and your April's already gone. If you have a 90 day sales cycle, for example, your April's already gone. And the work that you're doing today, the result shows up at some point in time in the future. So I, I, I would challenge people who think that passive uh, above the funnel, what I would call brand marketing or nurturing, uh, if, if you only had eight hours to prospect, you wouldn't do it on Twitter mm -hmm. and you wouldn't do it on LinkedIn right. and you wouldn't do it on Facebook. If you only had eight hours, that's all you have. You have to find a way to create an opportunity and you have eight hours to do it. You would go to the phone. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, then day two, if you only had eight hours on day two, you would go to the phone because you only have eight hours with which to produce a, an opportunity. I'm not suggesting that, that the social tools aren't wildly, wildly valuable. I mean, I've won a million dollar deal off of LinkedIn and mail because somebody could look at me and decide that I was a person worth talking to. I, I totally get it. That should consume a small part of your day. But the, mm -hmm. the problem is if you're not doing the things that allow you to pull the, the opportunity forward, then you're not doing the right work. So there's nurturing above the funnel work, which I think is important, but it's not prospecting. Mm -hmm. Prospecting is making an ask. I'm asking you for your time. I'm asking you to consider change. I'm asking you to, to do something different than you're doing. If I'm nurturing the relationship and I'm feeding you information, hugely valuable. And, and there's not very many people. I mean, I, I did the math I create 1,094 pieces of unique content a year personally, personally. There's not very many people who are as invested as heavily in content marketing as I am. Mm -hmm. But that said, if, if you want speed to results, you go with the fastest methodology and that's going to be, that's going to be the phone for almost all of us. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm curious. I would love to hear your, your take on this because I see people using social media all the time as a lead generator, you know, like, hey, and I tell people, look, the point of social media is you put content out there, people interact with it eventually. You know, I've been doing social media aggressively for three years, and I'm starting to get people coming to me regularly through social media, but it right. used to be very, very slow. And so the people who go into doing social media, do you, um, before they have the actual deals on the table, do you view it as a cop out? Or what do you, what do you think people use it as? This, this has been the big lie of uh, the people who talk about social selling as if it's a replacement for prospecting and the people who are just anti-phone. And uh, it, they, they've set up cold calling as a straw man. And uh, the, the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is, it, for, for a lot of businesses, I mean, if you're a thought leader, 
Absolutely makes sense. Absolutely. There's no question about it. For about a dozen people in a company, it probably makes uh, really, really good sense to, to spend their time developing content and content marketing. I, I am 100% for content marketing. But the fact of the matter is, let me try to give you an example. I, I work in financial um, services, and I have 600 salespeople. And, and following the social media advice, each of them should be building their own individual brand and writing a blog post each week and, and creating uh, content. So the first thing that happens is the legal department says, no one's allowed to write a blog post. Right. Okay, so now, now, now what is your strategy? Then you say, well, you know what? Marketing should write a blog post. Marketing can't say anything because it's against the law and we'll get sued if we make any kind of pro pro promise at all. And so they're extremely limited. And, and it, it just doesn't make sense at scale to think that way. Now, are there 12 people out of that 600 that should be generating content that the rest of the sales force can use? Sure, absolutely. And those 12 people probably aren't allowed to do it either. The, the, the <laughs> second scenario, so think about somebody who sells industrial type stuff. Their clients work in a factory. None of the people have a computer in front of them. They're not on social media. They have no LinkedIn profile. And I have to either call you or I have to walk in the door to make that sale. Any time that this person spends on LinkedIn is time taken away from the easiest and fastest way to get to clients. So I think everything has its place and I'm not anti anything. I am, I'm omni-channel. I mean, I, I think LinkedIn, if your clients are there, be there. If they're on Facebook, be on Facebook. If they're on Twitter, be on Twitter. If they're on Instagram, be on Instagram. I doubt they're on Snapchat. It doesn't look like a B2B play, but if they are, go there. Go there and snap your face off. I, I mean, whatever you want to do. But the, the, the challenge is, if you have a need for speed to results, you have to choose real prospecting and not nurturing, which is important, and not brand building, which is also important. Everything has a place. Exactly. I love how you, think, how you distinguish those three. I really do. I just, it just makes me smile because I have such a hard time getting people to understand that sometimes. But go ahead, Mom. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I built a, a fan base in Twitter in Ireland, but it took a year. It took a full year before I was able to get any clients out of that. So, so we, we do, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's true. There's value to social media, but it's not the only strategy that we have for building sales, and it, neither should it be. And uh, I think one of the things, which is why I reached out to Anthony, is because I've been studying, been doing a lot more work in the area of prospecting and realized the things that were ham hampering me before was my reluctance to pick up the phone, my reluctance to talk to somebody that I had never spoken to before. And, um, and so, you know, Anthony has the, he has a great book out, the only sales book you'll ever need. The only right? sales guide you'll ever need. Yeah. The only sales guide you ever need. I have it by the way. It's so unfortunate that title since I have a second book coming out in 60 days. <laughs> Well, I'll get on the pre, uh, the pre buy list, excuse me, the pre buy list for that. But um, the, another thing that you talk about, Anthony, is improving business acumen. And you mentioned that earlier in this conversation. But for our listeners, what does that mean for you and how can they improve their, improve their business acumen? Uh, listen to CNBC on your, your way to work and on your way home from work and on your way to appointments. I mean, if you have Sirius Satellite, turn on CNBC. You're gonna listen to CEOs talk about their business, talk about their strategic concerns. You're gonna listen to commentators talk about whether or not the Fed's gonna raise interest rates, what the labor markets are like. You're gonna listen to people talk about risks in the economy, what strategies are working, how Amazon disintermediated whole industries and is gaining dominance. This morning they were talking about there may just be one store left at the end and it's just Amazon. I mean, that, that might be the only store left. And they were talking about some book that describes that, but I can't recall what it is right now. Uh, it's a fictional book, but it's almost like the company store kind of thing, you know, where mm -hmm. there was a whole city built around a, a, a company 
and the company took care of everything. I mean, and, and that's, that's the kind of insight and the kind of ideas that you're picking up if you're just in business all the time. And for me, I have my presets. So Howard Stern is number nine and CNBC is number eight. So when they go to commercial, I'll go give a little listen to Stern, which I want to hear. And then I'll go back to CNBC and then I'll go to uh, hair nation. So I can listen to my music from the, the mid eighties and early nineties. But it, it's it's finding ways to pick up new insights and new ideas and just being immersed in business because you're a business person. So you have to read um, not all business books. I think nonfiction is super helpful for getting your business acumen, but business books, listening to things, picking up magazine, pick up Wired, pick up Fast Company, uh, mm -hmm. and study. I mean, when, when Facebook does an event, watch it, see what they have to say. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I mean, you, 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 you have to pay attention and you have to come up with some ideas so that you understand how to have business conversations with people. Yeah. Well, I think that allows you to have that conversation as a peer, even if you don't know everything about their business, right. you have that conversation as a peer. And I love that you brought that up because we talk to people all the time about how you become the average of the five people you hang out with most. And I tell people sometimes those don't have to be people you hang out with in real life. Sometimes those are, those are books that you read or people you listen to or, you know, podcasts, radio shows, TV shows, whatever it is, but you got to watch what you're putting in there because it's going to influence what ends up coming back out. Um, now I know That's I right. do have one more question because we kind of talked about this earlier, but I know a lot of salespeople are scared to death about the high price thing. And I've seen people, salespeople, three people in the past weeks trying away from high prices as far as in their sales. So a lot of people are afraid of it, but from what I'm understanding, you look at embracing your higher price as an asset rather than a liability. Absolutely. It is an asset. I mean, your, your higher proof, your higher price is proof that you're worth paying more for. I mean, that's it. You have a higher price because you're creating greater value. And that, that, that's how price works. It's a heuristic. It's a rule of thumb or a shortcut. I mean, when, when people look at a Mercedes, they know it's not a Hyundai. They, yeah. they know that. And they know it's not going to be priced like a Hyundai or a Kia. Not that there's anything wrong with those cars. Both those companies are making really good cars now. Mm -hmm. But it's not a Mercedes. And, and you know when you go into a Mercedes lot, you're getting something that's very, very different. But salespeople are afraid of their price because they think, well, my competitor is a Kia. So I need to be priced like a Kia, but I still should be a Mercedes. No, that's mm -hmm. not how it works. If people perceive the additional value, and that's our job to justify the Delta to say, let me help you understand the greater value. Higher price is a, it's, it's a sword. It's not a shield. Mm -hmm. You don't hide behind it and spring it on people at the end and say, by the way, now I have to give you our price. And they go, wow, I had no idea. You're so much more than your competitor. You use it right from the beginning to say, listen, Stephanie, um, these challenges that we've been talking about, I'm absolutely 100% sure I can help you with them. But our price is going to be a little bit higher than what you're paying right now. And I want to help you understand that we invest that money in our staff and in a number of our processes and some of the other things we do to deliver this outcome. And when people short that and they don't spend the money on that outcome, you don't get what you really want as you've described it to me. Does that make sense to you? And I'm, I'm going to have a conversation early, early. I, I need people to understand they need to make a bigger investment in the result mm -hmm. that they want if they want that result. And anybody can have any result they want if they're willing to pay for it with time and energy and resources. Mm. Money being one of them. Exactly. And when people understand that money is energy, I mean, it, it is. Yes, it's the stuff that we pay. It's the credit card. But more and more, when we understand that money is energy and, um, you know, that really is an important part of the value to help people understand Yeah. that um, in my housing business, I run into that occasionally Well, somebody will say, well, you know, could you do it for this? And I, and I smile and I go, you know, if I did it for that, I could not give you the service you're expecting, the kind right. of the quality that you and I both want to make sure you get. So if the price is too high, I totally understand there's, this down the street but right. if you want this service then you need to consider this and um, I just recently had a client 
that they contacted me, they wanted this, our service, and they rarely go above a certain price point. But I have committed to putting out my price, whatever it needs to be, and I made sure that I had the proper margins in there to be able to service the unit correctly, properly. They came back the next day and said, we'll take it. And I almost jumped out of my skin, thought, wait a minute, you've never done that before. But I held myself back and said, great, let's move forward. <laughs> right, right. You know, um, because it you, is, it's important. You helped them justify the investment that they needed to make. And, and look, if you're, I said this before, if your competitor was capable of helping them make a greater investment to get that result, they would have already done it. Exactly. They're not doing it. So somebody has to step up and decide, I'm going to have the conversations about what really has to happen to make real change to help these people get the real result they want. And a lot of times it's just investing more. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we are definitely, and I know Stephanie will agree with me, we definitely do have you back, Anthony. And, um, but before we, so we do need to kind of close things out a little bit here. Do you have any last thoughts for anybody that's listening and um, how can they get in touch with you and how can they be ready to pick up your next book since the ultimate sales guide now has a, another following? Yes. Uh, best place to find me two places, the And that's, that's the, my hub on the internet. And the second place is youtube.com forward slash Anna Reno. That's the daily show. And um, the book, the only sales guides available on Amazon right now. And the lost start of closing is available for pre-order, but don't buy it. Wait until a month from the date that we're recording this July 8th and go to the lost art of closing.com. And we'll have bonuses there. You want to buy it where you get the bonuses. Not just like ebook bonuses, real bonuses. <laughs> nice. So It'll July eighth. July eighth. Then that will do. We'll launch the pre-order page then, and uh, the book will be released August eighth. Cool. August eighth. Cool. Wow. Well, thank you for joining us, Anthony. This was. Thanks this for having fun. me. Really, you know, I will say, you know, after the after the wait and schedule and schedule, and I keep hearing about San Anthony guy, I will say you certainly lived up to uh, to the expectations. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we're so grateful to have you. Um, to our listeners, join us again next week. You know, we always bring great guests on. You know, we always have awesome content for you guys. But also join us in the Facebook group because it's worth it to get in there, get the inspiration daily, weekly. Uh, it's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash black belt selling. In the meantime, go out there. Know that you have control of your life. You have control of your future. Decide to make it a great week. I'm Stephanie here for Anna. We are the Black Belt Sellers of Southwest and Central Texas.